So welcome everyone. We're getting started now. Hola, hola. It seems that everyone's been on time, more or less. Um, so welcome everyone to the um, the conference part of this Pi Data. I hope that you will enjoy that. I hope that all the people that was in the workshops yesterday also enjoyed them themselves. And uh, to start, we have our keynote speaker. It's a pleasure to have Christine Dodge here. And uh, he will talk about the uh, Hitchhiker, Hitchhiker's Guide to, sorry? Data science. To data science. So lots of data science to start. Thank you. And give applause, an applause to Christine. Good morning. So this is a story, story of the Hitchhiker's Guide to Data Science. So I don't know if you know how the story begins, but far out in the uncharted backwaters of unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a small unregarded yellow sun. Orbiting this at a distance of approximately 98 million miles is an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet whose ape descendant life forms are so amazingly primitive that they still think digital watchers a pretty good idea. This planet has, or rather had, a problem, which was this. It had a lot of data and not enough data scientists. So that's why they wrote the Hitchhiker's Guide to Data Science. This guide has already supplanted the great Encyclopedia Galactica as the standard repository of all knowledge and wisdom. Let's introduce it. Before we start, let's explore the galaxy. What does the galaxy look like? First of all, we can separate the galaxy in um, four different solar systems. One is the setup. The other one is the exploration, then the learn and scale. The setup is like when you decide what development environment you're going to use to do data science. Um, a lot of people might have been using SAS or MATLAB, uh, Python, R, etc. And then you need to decide what's going to be your interface, your IDE, whether you're going to be using Jupyter Notebooks, uh, PyCharm, uh, R Studio. MATLAB interface, if you're just going to use a um, text editor and run things from, from the command line. The exploration phase is when you start asking questions to your data. You ask queries. You transform your data, and you visualize it. In learning, we're going to do machine learning, deep learning. is when we start doing predictions, uh, grouping, uh, clustering. Um, Optimus, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of ma machine learning techniques are based on statistics and optimization. And then we, we get to a point where a lot of these tools have traditionally been developed for uh, single node, single threaded uh, applications. And then we have a problem when we, our data scales beyond that. And we have to learn how can we scale our processes to manage those amounts of data. And there are different um, categories that we can apply to like, solve that problem. Sometimes with compiled assets, using parallelism, using distributed file systems, uh, or uh, you know, issues that come with real-time processing. So today, we're going to open the book of the Hitchhiker's Guide of the Galaxy. And we're going to explore you know, what's going to be our setup, um, how are we going to explore, and how are we going to scale our, our solutions. First of all, I'm going to introduce Anaconda and Jupiter. Um, Anaconda is a Python distribution uh, with over 150 packages for data science. Uh, it comes with Conda, which is a package and environment manager uh, that has several um, things that make it really interesting uh, for data science applications. One is language agnostic, and secondly, it's cross-platform. So all of, this, all of those who have had pings installing Python on Windows have finally uh, have a, a solution for them. Anaconda is pretty large. So if you want a, a minified version and be able to manage your own environments, uh, you can just install Miniconda, which just comes with Python and Conda, and manage your own environments uh, through it. Anaconda Cloud is a web service that provides uh, hosting for uh, packages, notebooks, and environments. So it makes it very easy to share with, with each other. 
And then these content environments is, are these like custom sandboxes that are isolated that provide um, a way to like reproduce projects, uh, data science projects um, with each other, make, making them reproducible uh, without all the complexity that comes with things like Docker or virtual machines. Why, why Anaconda? It's easy to install on all platforms. It's trusted by leaders in the industry. Uh, Azure Machine Learning uses it as, as its backend. So if you're using Azure Machine Learning from Microsoft, um, they're just running Anaconda. It has a large user base, over 3 million downloads. It's VSD licensed, which means it's free for com re commercial redistribution. So if you build something on top of Anaconda, like Microsoft does, you're free to like, make a profit out, out of it. Um, it's language agnostic, so for, as we know, data science is not just like a, a monogamous uh, language as, as, as we have a combination of Python, R, uh, SQL, uh, Scala. Um, you can use Conda to manage packages in all those languages. And then it allows these custom sandboxes that makes it very easy to like, share with each other and reproduce your results. So that's an introduction. What's the newest thing that, uh, that's happening in Anaconda? We have um, MKL optimization, Navigator, Conda Forge, and R. Starting from February release, uh, Anaconda 2.5, it comes with default MKL optimization library by default, which used to be a paid service. Now it's free for all um, and, and improves performance uh, roughly by 7%, um, no, times, times 7 and it's available by default and free for everyone. You can just like Conda update Conda and get the, the 2.5. There's a newest release uh, that we bumped to 4.0, and that's also going to have um, the MKL optimization. Navigator. Nav Navigator is a desktop graphical interface because we're trying to like bridge the gap between people that have been using anal doing analytics for a long time uh, using um, UI interfaces like SAS and are not very familiar with the command line. Up till now, you pretty much had to use the command line to uh, install packages. Now we're trying to like bring on board all those people who have been using SAS Enterprise Guide or other uh, UI commercial tools and are able to like manage launch applications for, from the applica from this uh, application, um, manage environments. And also, we have the learning and community tabs, which provide videos from PyData conferences, uh, other uh, tutorials that are available online so they can learn uh, from those videos. And they get it directly, and it's updated. Um, so for previous people who might have um, known Anaconda la Launcher, um, Navigate is, is, is a substitute for Anaconda Launcher. And it also integrates with Anaconda Cloud, so if you build packages and you want to upload them or upload notebooks, that uh, is also provided. So Conda has been a major effort at Continuum Analytics, um, the company I work for, but now it has uh, been majorly adopted by the community. So it's not just Continuum Analytics, the ones building Conda packages and providing them to the, to the open, but there's also this community called Conda Forge. Um, which builds, automatically be, builds Conda packages through um, different continuous, continuous integration systems and makes them available, directly uploaded uh, in Anaconda Cloud, so anyone um, can add that channel and install packages that the community maintains. So if there's a package that you want, we get a lot of requests. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be us, you know, a, a company building packages for the community, but the community itself is adopting Conda as the package manager for Python and building packages themselves. We, we've also added support for R. So there's an R channel in Anaconda Cloud. Um, we also bundle a bunch of like, the most essential R packages for data science in a meta package called R Essentials. So if you install R Essentials, you get about 80 packages uh, in R for, for data science. And then we also have um, um, added uh, another channel called MRO, which distributes Microsoft R open. And that's also the R distribution that comes with MKL optimizations by default. So Jupyter. Jupyter can be your interface um, to doing data science. And Jupyter is this web application that allows you to create um, 
kind of a report of what you're doing. Because at the end of the day, data science is about storytelling. It's not about just like presenting, uh, doing you know, something and, and having a results back, having like data transform or, or having some predictions. But you need to sell those predictions to someone, maybe in your business, uh, to like buy in into what your model has done. So providing a context around what you've done is really valuable. And Jupyter allows you to do that by not just writing code, but by, by adding explanation text, by adding interactive visualizations. So what's new in the Jupyter sphere? Two projects. Um, one are the extensions, and I'm going to you know, talk about NB Present and Content Environments. And another one also related with the R support, the IR kernel. So extension, NB Present. So um, I bet you all know that in Jupyter Notebooks, uh, you can um, translate your notebook into a slide deck that uses Reveal.js. Uh, what has typically happened is that you didn't have a, a theme editor to edit the, th the presentation in a way that looked maybe a little bit more corporate. So NB Present is a Jupyter extension that builds an uh, editor in your Jupyter Notebook as a plugin um, that you can activate and then you enter it and have the ability to edit slides, layout, and the themes. We also have been developing a lot of other extensions for some of our um, paid products, but made so those extensions open source. And we have two, one is called NB Conda Kernel, so that allows you to, like, from the Jupyter interface, select what Conda environment, what Python interpreter or R interpreter you want to use um, in, in the notebook that you start. And you can also navigate and edit packages that are included in those environments through the Jupyter interface. IR kernel. So um, Jupyter has moved from just being a, a IPython notebook um, centric, so centered around Python, to using the same interface with a variety of kernels. Uh, one of them is the IR kernel, which has uh, R as its backend. And you just, um, we've made it very easy with Conda and the R Essentials package, so you can just con install R Essentials, and when you start a Jupyter Notebook, you'll find R as one of the options to start a notebook. And you see that right here, uh, the notebook here is R, so you can you no longer need any like magic cells to run R. You directly can write R in a cell and get and get your results. So no matter if your team is using Python or your team is using R or some of you are using R and Python, you can still still use the same interface to communicate. Let's move to the the second part: exploration with pandas and bokeh. So Pandas, what, what is Pandas? Pandas is this high-performance uh, uh, package that provides these uh, data structures. The most common one is a data frame, uh, and has a lot of methods around it that makes it very easy to like, uh, transform um, your data. Uh, it's kind of like a building block. Uh, it's built on top of uh, NumPy, uh, and, and it's very widely used in the industry. It started in a um, high-performance trading um, you know, hedge fund finance. So it, it really has um, evolved from that, and now it's used in like sciences, data science, and, and other fields. So what's new? So I don't know if you've noticed, but it has a new logo. Uh, there's a sticker with a new logo on like the num focus table for the stick, sticker um, madness people. Um, and some of like the most recent changes. Uh, there was a lot of um, you know, changing Windows functions um, to methods, um, also integrating with, with X-Array, which is a, another a Python library um, for array computing label or, uh, that makes it very easy to work with label arrays. Um, something pretty big, it has adopted the um, ability to read SAS files. So in that effort of trying to move people towards the Python uh, open source community, from commercial tools that is going to be very valuable for people adopting in industries where they're heavily using SaaS in their enterprise and being able to read and integrate with people maybe in your team who are using still that, that tool. 
And then something very neat that came um, not in this last release, but in uh, a couple ago, is this like conditional formatting on your data frames tables in Jupyter notebooks. Um, so you can now you know, identify when uh, different values are maybe negative or have like some gradient of the values so you can visually um, identify when something, uh, you know, when a value is like too low or too big or bucket them. And then also um, there's one here on uh, having kind of this histogram built in uh, your, your data frame. Um, so we have pandas. With pandas, we've been able to like do some transformations, some queries. Um, but at the end of the day, we want to visualize. And we have Matplotlib and other visualization libraries in the Python ecosystem. Uh, but Bokeh really is innovative in the sense that it makes it very easy to build interactive data visualizations without having to write any JavaScript. So no JavaScript. You can build kind of D3-like um, visualizations uh, directly in Python. And we also have bindings in R, Scala, and Lua. It's very easy to embed in web applications. So if you have a team uh, and you, the result of your data science project um, is a web application, it's very easy to put that visualization into it. Even easier if you're using things maybe like Django or Flask. So it's all in the like, Python ecosystem. And then um, server apps is when you know, you're not only having like this static with some interactions um, in the front end, but actually calling back on the server to run some computations when you've moved maybe uh, a widget in the front end in the client side. So what's new in Bokeh? So we have um, Bokeh Server, uh, R Bokeh and Shining, and then Data Shader. Bokeh has had a server for a while. It's not like a new feature. But in January, with the um, 0 010 release, there was a new, completely new rewritten um, server backend that uh, uses Tornado and WebSocket. Um, and this allows you to do things like, um, for example, this example here, uh, what it does is like as when the user selects an algorithm to apply into your data set, it goes to the back end, it runs scikit-learn uh, on that model on your data set, and comes back with the results in the front end. So things like that where the user uh, can interact. So imagine uh, you know, building web applications that allows you to like, visualize different algorithms with different variables, um, things like that. We also have a new improved gallery with some of those examples of server, um, server app examples, um, like the movie set review where you can like, um, look at different uh, you know, filter by different values of movies by rating or uh, year, et cetera. We also have improved a lot the geo, um, geo capabilities. Here we have um, an example of like different types of tiles um, that are supported. A lot of people ask, well, um, how about um, Bokeh R? How does that work? Uh, is that like something that's like a competition with uh, thing, something like Shiny? Uh, and really, it, it does integrate well uh, with, with Shiny. So we have an example here um, that is just using RStudio. Uh, you have a UI interface um, that's based on Bokeh, and then it gets updates uh, on the back end and just like does random uh, things. But, uh, at the end, uh, the back end is using Shiny, and the front end is using Bokeh. So it's easy to integrate as well. So one of the most recent projects in, uh, the Bokeh, in Bokeh land at Continuum is this project called Data Shader. And Data Shader is this graphics pipeline that allows you to build meaningful representations of large um, amounts of data. And even if it's, they're not large amounts, it does improve some of like uh, visual issues that we have with not that large of a data set. And we're going to see some, some examples. So when we visualize data, there's some, some issues that occur. And 
It's, it's more so when it, the data is larger, but these are not that many points. And we already can see how the visualizations might be misleading in interpretation of what, what we see. An example is what we call overplotting. So here we have two distributions that, that have exactly the same amount of points. But depending on like the order that, the, that you're going to render those points, you might have the sense that one has more points than the other one, right? So here we, we're seeing that blue is more um, dominant and here red. And that's misleading because like, they actually both have the same amount of, of uh, points. Another problem is like when people try to fix this issue, they try to do saturation. Um, so with saturation, it improves a little bit, but it's still it's like a matter of number of how many um, points overlap. And with these parameters, right in this example here, it's just really if ten points overlap, you're still getting this misleading uh, feeling. So it doesn't solve completely the problem, and it's very hard to tweak the parameters. Another point is like undersampling. When you have uh, large amounts of data, people tend to like um, sample to visualize. But you can see like how distinct um, the visualization looks depending on how you're sampling, how many uh, points you get, and how many and how large the dots are. So, to solve some of those problems um, or all those problems, we created this visualization library called Data Shader. And just like to visualize like what, you know, that we traditionally do something bad, like that, that this is common and we see these visualizations all the time, this is actually a visualization of like my first talk that I gave at a Python conference. And uh, at PyData, no, Py Texas 2013 or 14. So we can see here that, you know, and this was a, a project I was working for the uh, DARPA, which is like the U.S. Defense Agency. So you can see in what territory they were interested in gathering tweets. But besides that, that's the only thing the, the this visualization is telling me, right? Where my interest is. Uh, but I'm not really able to to tell, you know, how how is this like, how much distribution I have in like Turkey or like you know Saudi Arabia, India, like because all these ploy points overlap. So that's the difference between visualizing something, you know, that, that is just going to tell me, um, you know, select a zone of interest, while another visualization that this is done with data shader actually gives me a sense of density. And, I, and with this graphic pipeline, it's not just about density, but I can also ask interesting queries to my data. For example, this one here is um, the New York um, taxi data set. And what we ask is, um, plotted blue if there are more drop-offs than pickups, and plotted red if it's the other way around. So we can see interesting patterns, like um, you know that the drop-offs are in like the side, small side streets, while the pickups are in like the larger um, uh, vertical uh, large streets. We also can see all these like. Uh, Outliers, because this is a river, right? Like no one's gonna pick you up in a uh, cab on in the middle of the river. And th then this part here is also very interesting. Um, this uh, is the LaGuardia Airport, and you can see how the uh, blue are very well defined, while the red ones are kind of like messy and noisy. And that's because the pickups are underground. So the GPS signal is bad, while the uh, drop-offs are in like uh, you know like without any construction around it. So the GPS signal is very good. So just with this visualization, we can see things like that. We can also like see you know Central Park, um, and 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 not just like we can also take a sense of like density, right? Uh, and, and points that are very, you know, are commonly uh, pickup zones, uh, drop-offs, etc. So, um, I, I think I mentioned it before here, but Data Shader uses um, in the backend um, 
to scale things like Dask and Numba. And now we're going to see some examples of, um, or we're going to talk about um, Dask and Numba. And this one here I didn't mention, but this visualization here is about it's the census data also in New York. Of the, uh, Manhattan is right here. You can see Central Park. Um, and it's the census data, and it's colored by race. So you can really see um, race segregation in uh, New York with just uh, this visualization. And all of this is Python, and there are very few lines of code. All the notebooks are available in Anaconda Cloud, so you can like download this notebook and run, um, get the data and run and run um, them to get the same uh, very cool visualizations. So now we've got to a point where um, you know we're not working anymore with data that fits that might fit. Uh, in memory, which is kind of what has been a problem with uh, NumPy and Pandas, right? And we want to scale that. And there's different degrees of scaling, right? Um, there's a point of data that fits in your laptop, but not fits in RAM. And you might also want to treat that. And computers and you know uh, instances in Amazon uh, get pretty large. So you could still like do a lot of things with just data that fits in, you know, in memory just by getting bigger boxes. Um, if that's not the case and you just want to use your, your laptop, then you might have like 8 or 16 gigabytes, right? So data sets that are larger than that, you might need, um, you know, you might think, what, what do I do then? And a lot of like people think, oh, that, that's already big data. You should start using Spark or whatever. And that's not true. Um, you can still do a lot with multiprocessing, multithreading, uh, and getting those results. And, and that's why what we did um, with Dask uh, is simplify the user experience on using uh, multi-threaded, multi-processing um, schedulers by just providing a NumPy-like and Pandas-like API to the user. And then um, you know, it gets parallelized in the back end, but you don't, feel, you don't need to like, worry about all the issues that come with parallelism. So that was a, um, just a snapshot. But um, so Numba, Numba is a project also that started at Continuum, and it's trying to like help you speed up your applications that you write in pure Python and get speed ups that are close to performance of C, C++, and and Fortran. And uh, it does so with providing a very easy interface with it's just a decorator that's called JIT to JIT that function. Um, it also supports um, CPU and GPU hardware. So if you want to take advantage of your GPUs, um, Numba also supports the compilation for that. And it integrates well with the rest of the stack, um, given that a lot of like the developers uh, have also been, you know, developers of other libraries in in the in the stack. So as I mentioned before, Dask is this parallel uh, framework uh, that. It's familiar because it implements the APIs of NumPy and Pandas. Um, it's very fast for, uh, for numerical applications, and we've benchmarked that with things like Spark. And for array-like computations, uh, we, we can perform 10 to 100 times faster in also cluster, cluster size scale, not just like single uh, node with multi-thread and multi-processing schedulers. So basically what Dask is, is this um, collections uh, that can be like arrays, uh, which is like very like similar to NumPy arrays, data frames, very like to like uh, pandas data frames back. It's kind of like a JSON-like uh, data structure for treating things like uh, text um, from returns from um, JSON. And then imperative is just a way um, if your you know your code does not fit those data structures and you have some custom code by using imperative. You can also build these graphs um, of tasks that need to be executed automatically, and then when those graphs are created, then it's when we have when uh, we have different types of schedulers that we that we can adapt depending on how large is our problem. So um, you know it might be that just using a, a threaded or a multiprocessing scheduler already like fulfills our needs because our data is not as large as to use a distributed you know cluster of computers. If we do have that requirement, though, we can use 
the distributed scheduler. Um, and so what DAS does, it also has like very neat visualizations um, for diagnostics and also for monitoring the state of, of your computation. And we can see, for example, um, this one uh, shows off like what's being computed, uh, what's already done, uh, and what's the next task that, uh, that is being processed. So what's new in the desk? Uh, this is very recent. We just were just two weeks um, ago. We announced this at Strata San Jose um, of the Hadoop integration with uh, with Dask. Um, so now we can directly read and build data frames and NumPy arrays from data that's on HCFS, uh, and also use resources uh, through Yarn. Um, we also have like fancy uh, widgets that allow you to like look. Um, know how far away your computation is so you don't like have a sense of you know how long it's going to take to finish which is also pretty neat when you're running jobs in a distributed environment and you don't know if you have to wait an hour or or 30 minutes or you know you have to go to you know to home and come back the next day and see the results um, it also has um, you know also use this bokeh we try to use our own project um, to improve so um, and this provides uh, also a, a real-time interface to see, uh, you know, what each worker is executing, uh, and also what's your memory and CPU usage in real time, so you can monitor these things. So, up till here, this is what's been the Hitchhiker's Guide to Data Science for today. Remember the, the answer to the universe. Don't forget your towel. And thank you very much. This is my Twitter handle. You can get the slides at bit.ly, um, pydata, matt42. So an applause for Christine. So we have some time for questions now. Anyone? Hello. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question regarding Dask. Dask. One of the things I don't understand very well is how it deals with uh, data sets bigger than you can get into memory. Because I understand that you get some parallelism and then you can use several calls, several machines. But for, for example, when I read the, the documentation about, about data frames, I get that kind of loads uh, different parts of the data and different data frames, but I don't know if it does it sequentially or how it deals with it, because from the documentation it's not clear and I, and I don't know where can I learn more about how, because if I use, for example, Spark, I know that uh, it gets some parts of the data you can, you can specify uh, how many processes you use and what it does, but in Dask, I don't, I don't know how it, what it does. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is a, like a very fast intro, but actually there's different layers of um, Dask. The, the first one is like the, let's, let's call it um, high level, middle level, and low level. The high level is in, it's what we call the imperative mode, in which you have your own code and you use, uh, and you just use it to, to build the, those custom graphs. So that's going to build that custom graph for you. The, the, let's say middle um, ground, it's just using, it's, it, that just implements um, a way to chunk um, NumPy arrays and pandas arrays. So it's just like the Dask array and the Dask data frames are just like chunked NumPy arrays and then Dask knows how to put them together for different operations. And then the low level is the part of, um, that you can actually define you, the graph task by just, it, the graph uh, description is just a Python dictionary. So you can actually define the graph by itself without needing to write, you know, uh, custom code or, um, or using the default data structure, but building your own um, to build, you know, to build something uh, like this if that's what you want it to do. And then once you have the graph, uh, what that's, you know, so for a long time, that just builds that graph. And then when you want to uh, execute it, you call compute. And compute is the one where you tell what scheduler you want to use. And for each scheduler, you have different variables that you can set, like number of processes, um, you know, number, number of workers, um, et cetera. Um, the way, like, the, it's going to depend. So 
in the distributed environment, um, Dask is going to try to use data locality to know what to execute first where. Um, so I, like when you say sequentially, you want to make sure, you want to kind of put restrictions on what gets executed. Um, is that your concern or? or because you said like variables, you want to control variables like number of um, threads or processes, but then also the sequence of when things get executed. How does it know what the, what it has to load first and later just to get something that doesn't fit into memory to be computed? Because of course you cannot use, for example, you, you have eight threads and you try to load 150 gigabytes of data, you cannot do it all right. Right. at the That's same time. Yeah. You want no, to I do it one uh, a first part and yeah. the second part. And right. I, so I guess it's done in, in, in the core right. automatically. So you can define like the chunk, like what, um, you define the chunk size, and then you have to define the chunk size that fits in your m in memory. And that's kind of like the, uh, you know, that that's what guarantees that you're not going to do something like that. So more questions. I have one. It's kind of not question about one. How do you get the uh, the geographical data, the maps? I mean, the map of New York was amazing. Oh, How that. do you plot on top of that? Oh, well, that, like there's like some of that, they're actually like, for example, this one here. Yeah, like, like there's that one. actually like the map comes, comes you, you can see the map because of the data. There's no, there's no map behind it. You just like see the contour based on like the. the okay, yeah, yeah, I see, fine. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just a quick question about data shader. You, uh, what type of glyphs are supported right now? Uh, yeah, so we, um, so sc scatter plots, and um, uh, and I think we just added, we was we'll just released this week version zero two, so it's still um, pretty new, uh, and we added support for lines, so time series data. Um, now we can also plot. We also have some examples. Um, that show, you know, when you have a lot of um, lines one on top of the other one, you also lose like density of the points. Um, so now th those two are the ones that we're currently supporting. Okay, uh, and do you plan to support more glyphs than those? So we'll have to check the roadmap. I'm not sure what's. Uh, I, I bet there there are more. What we, it also depends, like what you know, if people start using it and they have specific requirements, then that's gonna help put it in the roadmap. So if you have any suggestions, just open an issue and we'll put it there. Okay. We have time maybe for one short question. No? So let's thank Christine. Thank you.